Hi guys, I'm Mrs. Goswish, your chemistry teacher. Hi, I'm Mr. Kane, I'm the other chemistry teacher. And we are going to go through the scientific method. Yeah, fun, fun, fun. What is chemistry? The study of matter and how it can undergo changes at the macroscopic, microscopic, and sub-microscopic scales. Mm -hmm. So uh, things that typically uh, chemistry can uh, entail, uh, wood burning, great. Uh, food additives uh, get added to our food to not only make them look good, but also make them taste good. Uh, ice cream freezing has some great enthalpy problems, right? And thank God it freezes because it's so good. So good, uh, especially in the summer. Uh, the color in your clothes and your hair dye, you wouldn't look as good uh, if it weren't for chemistry, that's for sure. Steel rusts. Yeah, unfortunately, my first car found that one out. <laughs> and cookies bake, which is, again, a nice thing for chemistry to do because we love our cookies. Uh, finally, uh, even the memories that are being stored in our brain require chemistry to understand how that happens. All right, observation versus inferences. Strictly definition and observation using your senses to make notes about your surroundings. Senses, uh, is that like your common sense? Uh, yeah, if you have any. Otherwise, it'd be your eyes, nose, ears, etc. Uh, inferences, uh, inferences are the mental processes of making a conclusion. Inferences are usually based on uh, established prejudices. For example, in my classroom, just because a student walks in with a Lockport football jersey on does not necessarily mean he plays football. If I look at that kid and say, oh, football player, that's an inference. Uh, maybe he's just wearing the jersey. Maybe he's just wearing a buddy's jersey. Here's a little demo. Uh, basically what we want to do here with this demo is we want you to write down some of the observations as you see it. Looks like a beaker, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, not just beakers. one beaker, but there two beakers. Go. There we go. So we got two beakers. Okay, so we can count. It's awesome. Uh, let's see. Beaker on the left looks at about approximately, what, 250 mils? Beaker on the right around 350 mils? Uh-huh. Yeah, I think so. Uh, obviously, Ooh. water. Oh, hey. Ooh, an ice. ice cube. Oh, it's, it's room temperature. There was ice thrown in. Okay. Yeah. So the ice cube ice. floats over there. And, oh, my uh, God. The ice, ice cube didn't do the same thing. Uh-oh. The ice cube. The ice cube seems to have sunk and bubbles have formed. So this is interesting. Look at all the bubbles on the right. That's definitely floating. That one's definitely sunk. I thought these were huh. both water. Oh, they must not be. Well, uh, maybe that's not ice. Oh, oh, hold on. We were supposed to make observations. Hmm. It's supposed to be observations. Why are these all observations? Okay, so observations versus inferences. Well, definitely saw two beakers. Mm -hmm. There were definitely two of them. The one on the left definitely had 250 mils, but Ooh. based on the results... Uh, Was that actually water? Yeah, it might not have been water. Maybe an observation better would be a clear liquid. Yeah, they were, yeah, that right. was definitely a clear it liquid. Was a clear liquid. Uh, the, the, I guess the one on the right, uh, the same thing. We've got to just say that it was a clear liquid. Were they room temperature water? Oh, hang on. Were they room temperature clear liquids? Yeah, see, that would be hard to tell. There was no thermometer or anything like that. That was kind of an okay. inference. So that's an inference also. That's an I. I'm going to put I's next to these to mark them as inferences. They're not actually wrong. They're just inferences instead of observations. Uh, ice cube was thrown in? That's an inference, too. It looked like an ice cube based on what I know about ice cubes. Okay, so something was thrown in. So the fact that it was an ice cube is an inference. Uh, again, the right, the, the I, something floated. Object floats. The object, yeah, object. Definitely floated. Floated. The flakes or debris in the water. Did you see flakes? I saw. Uh, the left one I didn't see so well, but yeah, I think they were there. I thought I saw some flakes or some sort of debris in there. It wasn't, it wasn't bubbles because it didn't necessarily go up. It just kind of yeah, floated around. Yeah, I just saw something floating. Okay, again, object sunk on the uh, yeah, right Yeah, object, side. that's right, object. Object. And I did see bubbles. Yeah, I saw bubbles too. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, so we had some inferences here. It's actually going to be difficult to make sure we make observations all the time. Yeah, because uh, that past prejudice, I really thought that was an ice cube. But unless I have more information, maybe it wasn't. Uh, there are different types of observations that you can make. Some are qualitative. Some are quantitative. Uh, if you just use those prefixes, it's actually pretty easy to figure out which ones are which qualitative observations, just think about what qual, what word qual sounds like. It like, sounds like quality. So you're measuring qualities here, uh, not 
quantities. So qualities are going to be things like the shape, the color, um, whether Smell. it's hot. You could do hot or cold, right? Yeah, as long as there's no temperature, no numerical temperature. So you couldn't say 100 it. degrees, but you could say hot. Yeah, hot, uh, cold, smelly, non-smelly. And quantitative here. Well, what, what do we think of when we think quants? It's quantity. Q-U-A-N-T. I T Y quantity and that Q for some reason just looks odd but uh, quantities are things that have numerical values so like we said we said like red or hot or smelly as Mrs. Goswish put it uh, are all qualities but quantities um, I don't know like uh, oh we, we wrote that one down before 250 milliliters right yep 102 degrees Celsius 102 degrees Celsius um, 5 foot 8 inches tall Five foot eight inches tall. Hey, how do you like that? All right. All right. Scientific method. Steps to the scientific method. Read them and weep. Observation is made. That's your first step. Research is done. Background research on the observation. Hypothesis. A testable hypothesis is formed. Maybe that's something to write down yeah, here. It needs to be testable. Yeah, you got to be able to test it. Yeah. Uh, experiment to test the hypotheses and sometimes lots of experiments. Yeah, sometimes several. Uh, let me write that down here. Several experiments get done. Data is analyzed. So you check to see if the hypothesis was, uh, was supported or not. A conclusion is made. Okay. Results are reported. And results can go two ways. Uh, positive confirmation doesn't mean you're done. Usually with a positive confirmation you go back and you experiment again and again. Uh, scientists will, uh, will experiment anywhere between 3 and uh, 25 times before they actually publish something. Um, but then they eventually publish it if, it's a positive, if you get a positive confirmation. I mean think about the logic of it. Do you want the Food and Drug Administration to okay a new drug based on one experiment? Oh, heck they no. do tons, years and years worth of experimentation, years and years worth to make sure there are no side effects. Then they release the drug to the public. Yeah, FDA, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of experiments to make sure that nobody's hurt. Yeah. And negative confirmations just wind up going right back to the background research. Big question here, do all scientists wind up doing the scientific method the way we learn it, the, the way we just uh, show that diagram there? It turns out, no, not all scientists do the scientific method that way, because uh, science isn't really a very, uh, science is a rigid process, but it doesn't always have to follow that same format. Sometimes we wind up with pure experimentation. <laughs> Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. His lab notebook literally had hundreds of experiments written down in it. He wrote down, you know, a feather. Uh, a feather didn't work very well, so experiment fail, failed, experiment failed, experiment failed. He pulled out hundreds, hundreds of uh, different things before he came across a tungsten filament uh, to use. Accidental discoveries. The world's full of accidental discoveries. Alexander Fleming, he accidentally discovered penicillin. Experiment design. Know the definition, know the differences between variables. There are two types of variables. The independent variable is what you are going to change to see if it affects the dependent variable. It is the variable you can manipulate, and it gets graphed on the x-axis. The dependent variable is what you're attempting to change or affect. It's usually graphed on the y-axis. Uh, here's a little hint I like to, to tell. Uh, if you're trying to figure out which one needs to be graphed on which axis, the x-axis gets the independent, which is i. Uh, the dependent is the y-axis, which is here, and if you look at this and you read it this way, it says die. What do we all want graphing to do? So a control is a standard for comparison. I used to work in a lab, hospital lab, and if we ran somebody's blood, in order to know if the blood was right or wrong, we had a comparison. Constants are an aspect of an experiment that is not changed from one part of an experiment to, uh, to another. Um, uh, so uh, if you're doing a, an experiment, uh, say, to uh, find out what color light uh, affects plant growth. Oh, I like that experiment. Yeah, Why yeah. don't we do that example? So, uh, Look at wow, that. It's, it's almost like we An planned example. this. An example. I know. It's amazing. So the control in this case would probably be a plant grown mm -hmm. sunlight. in sunlight. 
Okay. Now the independent variable would be the different color lights that we're using, right? Right. So I'm using the, a red light, an orange light, and a blue light. Because the independent variable is what we could change. So we could swap out if we wanted to other colors. So those are the independent variables. The dependent variable would probably be how tall the plants actually grew. Because the dependent variable is your results to the experiment. Right. It's the thing that you wanted to try and see if this depends on that. Um, and then uh, what sorts of constants might I want to use here? Well, I would suggest you keep the amount of dirt and the size of the planter equivalent. Soil and planter, same. Okay, how about uh, the distance from the light? Ooh, that's a good one, yeah, like that. Distance from light, the mm -hmm. same obviously. Yep, well, water. Ooh, okay. Would, if you watered one more than the other, that would grow faster, so you gotta keep the watering amount the same. Water the same uh, amount. And time, yeah, at Ooh, the same yeah. time. And water at the same time. Same time. Probably wanna measure these things at the same time too. Yep. I was thinking too, maybe time of exposure would oh. be no fair if you had the red plant yeah. or the red light exposed longer than the blue. Amount of light, okay. <clears throat> as far as graphing this is concerned, again, remember we want uh, graphing to die. We want the dependence and the independent variable. Uh, you want to make sure you take notes about this because uh, this is graphing skills. You're using this throughout the entire year. So just a few things to point out. Again, dependent variable, the plant height, what we were trying to affect. Uh, independent variable over here on the x-axis, the color of the lights, uh, what we were using to try and affect the dependent variable. Uh, another thing up here to take notes on uh, is that we have a title. Ooh, a properly oh, formatted yes. title at that. Yep. Properly formatted title usually says that it's a figure and a number. Uh, and then it has some sort of a description on it. Usually the description actually tells you what, what the graph is about, which, uh, look at this. I've got both the dependent and the independent variables listed there. So you just kind of used them again for the label, the yeah. title. Science, nice. is science is repetitive. There you go. Science is repetitive. And the la the axes are all nicely labeled. Science is repetitive. Science is repetitive? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> science oh, is repetitive. The axes, look at this, it's labeled, labeled? and there's like units. Unit. Oh my goodness, okay. that's a nice graph. Also, if you check this out, the distance from one line on the graph to the next is the same. It's uh, 0.5 centimeters in this case. Uh, this axis, though, didn't actually use a measurement, so check this out. So is that qualitative, no, that no axis? Units. Yeah, this, the, uh, this one I believe is a qualitative axis, because oh, it's a that. quality, and I spelled that wrong, but, uh, and then we've got right, quantitative. We're not quantitative English. over here. Oh, so that's okay. the difference between so, quantitative and qualitative. Cool. You might have two different axes, uh, but you might have two of the same. They might both be quantitative. All right, scientific laws are general statements that describe how nature actually behaves. Uh, sometimes we call these natural laws. We all know about these natural laws. One of them is the law of gravity. We know that. Uh, let me get my pen here. We know that what goes up must come down. That is a law. Uh, it always happens here on Earth. Uh, matter of fact, if you get to the moon, it happens there too. You throw a ball in the air, it'll fall back down to the moon. All right, a, so a scientific law just describes how that nature is working. A scientific theory, on the other hand, is going to describe why nature behaves the way it is. Uh, theories wind up being human inventions, and they're prone to being rewritten rewritten. Uh, example here, we actually have a theory on gravity. Let me see if I can actually explain to you what the theory of gravity is. Uh, gravity is some sort of a force that's pulling us down, force of gravitation here. Uh, it turns out that gravity is dependent on a couple of things. Uh, one, there's a universal constant, G. Uh, two, it needs two masses to actually do uh, some pulling. We need the mass of the earth, and we need the mass of a person, such as Mr. Kane. Okay, so gravity is dependent on these three things multiplied by each other. So multiply by the gravitational constant, the mass of the earth, and the mass of me, and heck, I'm pretty heavy. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's also dependent on 
the distance that you are from something. The farther I get from Earth, the less gravity actually uh, works on me. That's why, uh, that's why if I got far enough out, the Earth couldn't pull me back in. Well, Mr. King, these are all physics terms, yeah? Yeah, these are all physics terms. Uh, they'll learn about this, uh, you'll learn about this next year, but uh, it's just the basic idea. You notice that a scientific theory has a lot of math involved in it. Oh, okay. So. Okay, whereas a scientific law usually is more based in observation about how something happens. Okay, so do we have, we have a couple of laws that come to the top of my head in chemistry, right? And the most important one being like the law of conservation of mass. Right. And energy, law of conservation of energy. We have several laws of conservation. Yeah. And they're just, they just state that uh, energy is conserved in a chemical reaction or that mass is conserved in a chemical reaction, that we don't gain or lose anything. There's no math involved in it. It just tells you what you, what you put in is what you get out. Oh, all right. Okay. I think that's it for today. Yep, that's it. Bye, folks.